I will say the same thing to start this as I um, just said with Jill, which is that I am like super excited to talk about this. This is my favorite subject and the thing I think about all the time. So um, uh, I'm really happy to chat with you about this. So I think I want to start with asking you the same question I asked you yesterday uh, when we met, which is explain what you do and what you're doing right now. So I was thinking about this a bit. We had a chance to catch up yesterday. It's great to be here. Uh, yesterday was super inspiring. Um, so it's, it's really wonderful to be here with everyone. Um, I, I think a lot about storytelling, and I think a lot about narrative, um, and I think a lot about how is it that we can use strategies with culture to make progress more quickly. And I think about it in that it's, it's happened before. And I, just to, to, to give a couple examples, and I think this gives context to what we're doing, um, but um, to quote Joan Didion, that we, we tell ourselves stories in order to live. And, and that was in, 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 her, in her White Album. And I, I think that that idea is something I think about a lot. I used to be in politics. Um, and when I was in politics, I thought a lot about Marshall Gantz, um, who some of you know, came up through United Farm Workers, now teaches at Harvard. Um, and he has a storytelling framework that, that I think in the context of what we're doing today, which is um, how do we tell the story of self? So how do we tell our own story in ways that connect um, with others, how do we tell the story of us, which is how does my story um, relate to all of you, um, and then how do we tell the story of now, which is, is the present, why is the present moment so urgent for us to be taking action? And for me, um, I grew up in rural Washington state. My dad was a vegetable farmer, my mom was a teacher. Um, my, my interest in compassion and climate came from, in many ways, kind of seeing injustice in the fields and, and migrant workers who were spraying pesticides, um, uh, there was an extraordinary drift of pesticides or cancer outcomes. So seeing kind of the injustice in labor as it connected to the food system, which then got me really interested in environmental issues, um, which then through the course of my career um, led me to working kind of dedicated on climate and storytelling. And when I think about the story of us right now, we are at this moment where um, humanity's in peril, the, the planet's in peril, um, but at the same time, we, we have um, kind of unparalleled um, access to technologies, capital, um, and solutions uh, to solve, to, to make, pro I shouldn't say to solve it, because that can sound Pollyannish, but to make, to make progress um, in, in averting some of the worst impacts on humanity. And, and the story of now is that, that this is the time to act. So what, what, what I'm doing today is I, I head up a new organization called Earth Alliance. Um, which was co-founded by Leonardo DiCaprio and Lorraine Powell Jobs. Um, and I, I started working with him about a year ago, um, really thinking how is it that we can um, leverage the power of, of story um, to think about how we change hearts and minds um, and, and ha start to inspire action um, in ways that, that drive us and move us to act. And when we talk about what Earth Alliance does is that we're investing at the intersection of climate and creativity and we're thinking about what are the, the networks, the kind of cultural networks um, that, that really shape how we look at the world and reach new audiences and engage them and drive them to action. So when we were talking yesterday, um, one of the examples that I gave is we're working a lot with um, digital creators right now. So creators who are really trusted by their audiences, um, reaching anywhere from you know, five, 10,000 people to tens of millions of people um, on issues like you know, fats, what, 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 what Kind of, if you have children, maybe you watch these on TikTok or YouTube or Instagram, um, thinking about how is it that we start to reach new audiences who haven't really thought about climate um, and inspire them to take action. And the, the ways that we have been thinking about this, and we can go into different topics, is one, I think that it's really important to think about how we inspire people to act. So political engagement, civic engagement, um, and I think oftentimes the environmental movement, that's been the answer. So calls to action from environmental groups saying, you know, pressure your legislator, your member of Congress. Um, but I think the other piece of it um, is thinking about changing how we live. And, and those are some of the things we were talking about yesterday. And I've actually seen this a bit in the climate movement, is I think increasingly we're coming back to the importance of demand side mitigation in, in, in emissions reductions starting to reflect again. I mean, you gave this great example of air conditioning. Um, but, but starting to reflect again on we actually do have power in our own individual lives. And the future, um, the future will look different. And <laughs> the, ways that we, the ways that we live, what we eat, how we cool our homes, um, how, we, um, how we move around, um, how, we, um, how we travel, 
Th those things will look different. They might not necessarily be better or worse, um, but they will certainly look different. Yeah, so this is completely interesting on, on um, so many levels. I mean, one of the things that you talked about yesterday, and I want to explore a little bit, is about this idea of motivating people through thinking about you know, a better life. Yeah. You know, that there's this whole um, you know, rhetoric out there that, oh, you know, I mean, the fossil fuel industry has been touting this for you know, 30 years, as long as I've been following this. You know, if you reduce the demand for coal, you know, you're all going to starve, and you know, our life as we know it will end. And um, that, but that subtext is very much part of the story. And one of the things you're trying to do is redefine this idea of you know, a good life, yeah. and that it, our good life is not dependent upon uh, fossil fuels, and it's not dependent on even the status quo in broadly. So, so talk to me a little bit about that. Explain a little bit. I think that's really interesting, this question of how we define what our lives will be and how you devise strategies to help people think about that. It's a really interesting question. And I, I think that one of the main, just to your point, the fossil fuel industry spent decades um, investing countless amounts of money um, to associate the good life with a life that is, is in many ways rooted in, in, in a fossil fuel-based economy. Um, and that, that takes, and there are so many micro examples of that. I mean, the, the, whole, the whole discussions over, over gas stoves and, and, and tracking the flow of resources. There's a great piece, great long piece in the Atlantic that was kind of unpacking the impacts of the appliance industry and, and making, making gas stoves socially desirable. Um, but, but that ability, I think what we have been thinking is how is it that you can make a low carbon future and the ways that that translates into our daily lives, the social default. Like how does, how does that become socially desirable? I mean, it's the sort of thing, I mean, that he, got, he got quoted for it when he said it, but the former mayor of Bogota that said, you know, our public transit system will work when rich people ride buses. And, and I think that those, those sorts of ideas are what you want to see in practice. So, and, and I think there are, there are very good examples of how that started to happen already. Um, I think, you know, as we've all seen, I mean, the, the social desirability of electric vehicles um, has transformed. Um, I think if you, if you look at advances that we've made in plant-rich plant -rich diets or plant proteins, um, I think that we've seen a lot of cultural shift in that area, too. I and mean, we have a long ways to go. Um, I think if you look at um, areas, and this is what we, you, had, you had this example before, that um, there's, there's, there's become kind of an American psychology and maybe globally beyond this, that the right temperature to have your house at is somewhere between 68 and 72 degrees. Um, we can actually live at, at warmer temperatures than that. <laughs> we, can, we can have a house at 75 degrees or 77 degrees and be OK. Um, but, but there's been a real normalization that, that that temperature is the temperature at which we're comfortable. Um, other examples, so we're working a lot with, with influencers doing work on fashion right now. I um, mean, I thought the, the talk yesterday um, on fashion was, was terrific. I think a lot of that is wrapped up in culture and thinking about, um, we've been thinking a lot about circular economy and thinking about reuse and ideas like shopping, shopping your wardrobe um, or, or thinking about, um, we released this, this content module working with digital creators who are working on food um, called Date Your Fridge. So how is it that you can look at food waste reduction um, by once a week um, having a date with your fridge um, and eating things that you might have otherwise thrown out. Um, so those are, those are some examples. I might show one slide here if this works. Perfect. So this is, this is one way that we've been thinking about kind of meta, meta narratives. And, and we think kind of if stories are the stars, um, kind of constellations or narrative and, and kind of culture is, 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 the, is the universe. Um, these are, these are four areas we talk a lot about internally, kind of how do you move from doom to possibility, how do you move from powerless to, to folks having a feeling of agency. I think sacrifice to benefit is a, is a massive narrative where for many, many years in the environmental movement, doing things that were environmentally sustainable was synonymous with, with some sort of sacrifice. <laughs> um, and I think moving, moving beyond that, not in a Pollyannish way, is really important. And then inevitability to action. Um, so those are, those are four ideas we think about. So I'm really bummed because we're getting a, a one minute slide, okay. which really is unfortunate because <laughs> I could talk to you for another two <laughs> hours. But um, one of the things you brought up yesterday that, that was really interesting, you know, is in, in talking about the power of 
these kind of the kind of cultural shift that you're yeah. talking about is how how well that worked with the sort of gay marriage thing. And and I think that's really true. I mean, obviously that's very true. Um, but it's also true that the parallels between the transformation of towards gay marriage and the transformation that we're talking about with climate change and away from fossil fuels are very different. Very and different. so one of the things that I worry about in this narrative that you're talking about is um, you know, when people figure out it's not that easy as yeah. like just, you know, passing laws for gay marriage, that it, this is a long fucking battle and a long transition that is not going to happen like by the time, you know, we finish our, you know, we get on the airplane or whatever to go home from Sun Valley. You know, this is, this is a long fight and we're just at the beginning. So how do you think about that larger narrative strategy? When I mean, I, I do think the fight for marriage also, I mean, I was just listening to this great podcast that was talking about how um, like the beginning of sodomy laws was like going back to St. Thomas Aquinas like in 1250, right? And like Aristotle had been like making progress and then along came like St. Thomas Aquinas and, and really like within like 50 years between 1250 and 1300 sodomy laws spread across Europe. So I mean, I think that you're still working with centuries, centuries of history here. Yeah. One, example, one example that we were talking about yesterday um, was that, um, and I think about this going back to what Jill was saying, which I thought was so important about Hollywood. Um, was that if you look back to like 2008, 2009, um, public support for marriage in the United States was somewhere between 35 and 40 percent. Um, at that same time, um, if you looked at scripted entertainment coming out of Hollywood, fewer than one half of one percent of all scripted entertainment coming out of Hollywood had representations of same-sex character, um, relationships between same-sex characters um, in them. If you fast forward to today, um, public support for marriage in the United States despite a lot of attacks still, um, sits at around 70%, um, massive gains. And, and at the same time, you now see about 20% of all scripted entertainment coming out of Hollywood having representations of same-sex characters. So I, I, in, in, in relationships or, or queer characters um, represented on, on, on screen. So I think that if we think about this, the, this interplay between culture and climate, um, I think a lot of what we need to be doing um, is really just Turning up, turning up the surround sound um, in ways that, that normalize um, different kinds of behaviors um, that become synonymous with the kinds of future that we want to see. Um, and I think a lot of that involves speaking to new audiences. Um, and we could go on on this topic, but um, I, I, we were talking a bit about that example. It's a really imperfect, for many, many reasons, it's an, it's an imperfect analogy. Um, but I, I think my takeaway from it is that that really being smart about deploying cultural strategies to reach new audiences um, can, can really open the aperture um, for, for progress. So I'm gonna push the boundaries for one minute because I wanna ask you one more question, which I think is really important is because you were in politics. And so, you know, one of the questions about this cultural shift is how political do you get, right? Yeah. I mean, obviously climate change in some by some definition, it is a political problem. Yeah. It's not a technology problem, it's, not, it's a political problem, right? And so how do you think about how political your strategies will be in thinking about how, how to shape culture? I think a lot of other groups are doing really great political strategies. I don't think, I think that's less of what we're focused on. I mean, I think for us, it's more of, I, I mean, I, it's been said, but I, I definitely think culture is upstream from politics um, in many ways, and I think that, that that given political space, politicians and, and campaigns can make a lot of progress. Um, but I think what, what I'm interested more in, what we've been interested in is more the ideas um, that have been powerful. I mean, if just if look, at, look at EVs. I mean, you, you had this trajectory where EVs became socially desirable. People wanted to use them more. The manufacturing infrastructure started to develop, so on and so forth. Along comes the IRA and so many state policies on, on clean energy and clean vehicle standards um, incentives for building out EV charging infrastructure. I mean, the, policy, the policies came and the infrastructure investments coming. Um, I think a lot of the, the upstream work was on, in some ways, around kind of a, the beginning of a cultural shift. I mean, the same is true, I think, with the development of like a plant protein market for, for, plant, for food, is that you now actually have a lot of public buying programs and public procurement that are, that are, are now changing policies to ensure that you know, you're purchasing plant protein um, into, into public purchasing programs. That, that, that didn't really work before people thought it tasted good. Um, so I think that those are, those are some of the, my thoughts on it. I, 
I think the political work is essential, um, but I don't think that's where we're where we're focused. Right. Okay. All right. Well, we got to wrap this up. Um, totally fascinating. I think you. what you're doing is hugely important, and uh, I applaud you for what you're doing. So, thank you. Thanks for this conversation. Thank you.